Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Simon Webb, and uh, I've been uh, doing a study of how crises are managed in the UK government, which uh, came to the attention of the organisers, and they thought we might have something to offer to this conference. I must say, I actually feel much more that I'm going to learn something coming to, 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 to the Netherlands at the moment. For the first time in 80 years, Britain has a coalition government, and British government servants are running round trying to work out how you cope with this. And so I shall be talking to as many people as I can about, uh, about what we can learn from this interesting experience, including for managing crises. Uh, can I make this move forward? Yes. Um, the sort of somber moment, of course, is to remember that you know, crises are, and, and risk incidents are often about people suffering. And so we, we should start, start from that. But it shouldn't allow that, I think, to take away from the fact that managing incidents well is important for the individual's concern, but is also an important moment for getting issues right. And the new, conser the new conservative liberal uh, Democrat government in Britain has actually said that it's going to dismantle some of the uh, new regulations that were put in place after the bombings in, in 7th of July 2005 in Britain, which this is the slide about. So that's an interesting feature of both that human dimension on the one hand, but doing good government on, on the other. Uh, the study that I did produced some themes as follows. First of all, that actions in early hours of incidents have been made much more critical by the continuous news and social networks. On that incident I just showed you, uh, within not only did we have, of course, enormous media coverage within an hour or two of the bombs exploding, but there were 7,000 messages sent into the UK media within the first three hours from people who had either seen the incidents or been involved or had families or been involved or otherwise wanted to comment. So the, the new feature of this is the social networks and that part. Secondly, we too share what Alex Brinkmeyer was bringing out very clearly, that there's a higher expectation of individuals getting information and support even interestingly, um, when they're overseas, and just show you an illustration of that. Oh, I'm not being very well getting this down. Yeah, this is the Asian tsunami of uh, December 2005, where, um, to take another example, um, uh, numbers of members of the Swedish government had to resign because they did not come back from their Christmas vacation to help manage the problems of Swedish holiday makers at the other side of the world who felt they were entitled to their government to take more interest than they did. So there's something about expectations here which is very important. I concluded that poor crisis management can lead to bad regulation or excess supervision in two main routes. Firstly, that question of the initial political and public handling leads to a lack of public confidence in the existing system. I think this is something that, one, that, that Group 4 was on to, that, that you get an, a momentum builds for doing something new in that situation, which is very hard to stop once it gets going. The second dimension, which is perhaps more subtle, is that inquiries are often given too wide a scope, particularly when they try to combine investigation with remedies and blame. And this, too, can lead to bad regulation. More of that in a moment. Here's an example from Britain, but also familiar, of course, here. This is animal diseases. This is actually foot and mouth rather than, than, than BSE, but actually um, an example of where crisis management was very difficult uh, to handle, where we had this dramatic response, as reflected in animals being burnt here, and we ended up within Britain. The most regulated sector of all is meat production, nearly still is, but at one stage there were two people supervising for every person working in the industry. And it's an example of how poor management of the incident, which was actually only ever affected 3% of, of, of farm animals in Britain, and actually was more of a threat to tourism than it was to the national economy on the farming side, um, that that actually led to a huge over overreaction, which was difficult to put back together again. And that was because we didn't handle it very well. I was involved, so I, I, I know about this. So some common errors that, if you like, lead you into bad regulation. I think one of them is hoping the crisis will solve itself and waiting to kick in the machinery. Because by the time you've waited too long, actually the momentum for doing some new regulation, of finding a fix, will have built. 
Another thing you can do is actually to exhaust your subject experts. In any government department I've ever worked in, there are about two or three people who know about any subject in any depth. And if they are overworked and overtired, when somebody comes up and says, let's do this new regulation, let's do this new thing here, they won't be fit enough to say, stop, I know about this subject, that is not a good move, because they've already worn themselves out working 16 hours days for three days. Some other mistakes which lose you confidence are quoting unchecked figures, which you then have to correct, attributing blame or legal responsibility. As a, as a German colleague put it to me, if you blame a person, it'll turn out to be the equipment, and if you blame the system, you'll turn out to be responsible for it. Um, sending your minister to the scene with nothing to say, if you send them there with nothing to say, they'll probably say something like, we'll stop this ever happening again. And when we did that on a rail accident, it cost us £5 billion on excess equipment on rail safety. <laughs> Leaping to new regulation with poor cost benefit when the problem was human error. That can be tough, actually, because it's sometimes nicer, particularly for nice bureaucrats, to, to blame the system rather than to actually say someone made a human error. But if you blame the system, you might end up doing something regulatory <laughs> stupid to correct it. Responding to lobbying and media stories rather than getting the data and holding on to your strategic aim. And then forgetting about people who are involved who then come back, come back and, and, and complain and, and otherwise disrupt um, the, the, the debate. And amongst those, of course, are local authorities, international organizations, and, and as we were hearing again this morning, the individuals affected and their families. It's terribly important to look after them properly um, from the outset. I think you also need to decide what the issue is, and this is uh, probably needs some explanation. This was an oil fuel dispute. It was actually an industri uh, industrial dispute come protest in 2000, but which actually brought the British uh, economy very close to a halt. We, had, we, we nearly ran out of, of distributed um, fuel supplies. And there was a, a an inclination on the part of the system to think, oh, well, we better tell the oil industry to keep, you know, 100 days of fuel readily available at this sort of notice. And Prime Minister Blair could, looked at it and took a completely different approach, which was to say, this is actually wrong in a democracy for a small group of people to be able to hold the whole country to hostage. And I'm going to actually go and make sure that we dismantle people off these, get people off these barricades and open it up and get the system running again. So his response was not to put in regulation, but to actually tackle the issue um, directly instead and to see it actually as an issue about values rather than about better regulation. Uh, another example, I think, is floods. Now, this is, of course, the world leading country on how you manage water, so I better watch what I say here. <laughs> but actually, I used to live near this town here, and there was a reason that they had a rowing boat in the backyard of the pub, which all British villages have. And that was because it's flooded every other year since the 12th century. And so you just need to be careful that you're getting a sense of proportion about what's happening. I mentioned earlier another important issue is the follow-up to the right outcome. I came to the conclusion that inquiries which muddle up blame and risk, though that must be dealt with, um, uh, are probably... Um, an unwise route to getting the right outcome. And I came up with the conclusion that the thing that happens, one of the best things you can do is to have a rapid initial investigation which is confined to facts and causes, preferably by a visibly independent expert. And that does two things, really. One is that it gives you a better analytical base of what you're going to do next. You do actually know what happened because someone who knows an expert has... has a, but it also gives you some time because while that's happening, the government doesn't have to make any moves, such as regulation or, or uh, 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 an erroneous response. And here's an interesting example of that. This is from the accident world. This is crashed aircraft. This is British Airways 38, a Boeing 777 airliner, which flew into the grass at Heathrow Airport off the runway in January 2008, when both of its engines, of which it only had two, failed simultaneously within about 30 seconds of each other on coming into land. Now, if you step back and put it in those terms, you might say to yourself, wow, you know, that's a bit of a risk, isn't it? Um, why would, you know, we've just worried terribly about aircraft having a problem with ash, but here is an actual e example of two engines cutting out at the same time. But actually, what happened in the, the accident world was that a branch which you have also in the Netherlands, the Air Accident Investigation Branch went to the scene 
and my minister I was in transport at the time was able to say the air accident investigators are on the scene, they found the black box recorder, and they've got the data out of, the, out of the, this computer, and they will now go away and work out what happened here. And that gave us a lot of time to try and get to the right answer, which actually turned out to be a technical design fault in the engine. Um, which the engineer w were able to correct. But nobody needed to do any regulating. It was, just a, it was just a fault, and it got corrected after a while. But meanwhile, the 700, the 777 aircraft, which populate the fleets of, you know, of most of the airlines in the world, continued to fly because we had found a trusted person to go in and do an investigation and to say, I will tell you when you need to stop flying. So I just leave that as an example of this idea of having an independent investigation. And that was separate from the question of what the pilots had done and everything else. I can give you examples of that. Don't get into blaming someone, or as happened in cases of some accidents at football stadiums, both um, in, in England at Hillsborough and also Herschel in, in, in near to here, um, to give anybody immunity. If you give people immunity, it seems to create a long-term public reaction. We are on our fifth inquiry now about why we gave immunity to the, to, to the response services at the Hillsborough Stadium where 100 people died at football stadium. And I think it's a great mistake to do that. Um, the, the emergency services have their own disciplinary procedures where they can go through these things. And if necessary, it can come to the courts. But it's very important, I think, not to do that. To test the public risk appetite, that's so important, as I experienced what I was saying this morning, to go and check what the public really feel about this, because often they're more sensible than they're given credit for, if I might put it like that. And so the recommendation is to keep separate the taking of responsibility, which you sometimes need to, obviously must have criminal, civil, complaints, disciplinary procedures, and parliamentary scrutiny of the executive, of the executive to try to separate that out from managing future risk by policy analysis, which balance costs and benefit and better regulation or supervision comes through if it should, but doesn't if it shouldn't. So you need to, I think, separate those two processes out. So I've got a checklist for the early hours and days. I'm probably getting up near my time, so I'll, I'll just quickly sc scope through those, which is to try and find out the data of what actually happened. Don't work off um, initial reports. They're almost certainly wrong. To try to find somebody in a government department, and I think it's usually in most governments about the DG level to take a view of whether this is a real crisis or whether it's just a flurry. If it is a real crisis, you need to put together a team very quickly within a few hours in the British system to manage the crisis so that you don't make a mistaken step on regulation. And I think that should include a minister, a subject expert, some crisis people, including a skeptic, and representatives of individuals and the public. To think about the wider context and desired strategic outcome to get risks in proportion, I think that's something that ministers can do, and to give ministers a holding line to use. It's all very well to say to your ministers, don't say anything, which of course is the natural reaction of most bureaucrats, but they live in a political world in which they have to say things. But there are things they can do. They can say, I have started the independent investigation. I've engaged my crisis management team and I have a group of people working on this, I personally will take an interest in what's happened to the affected individuals and make sure that we are looking after them as best as we can. There are a range of things you can say and do as a minister in this opening space without necessarily having to jump straight into courses of action which you can't judge in the first day or two. So I think you need to support your ministers in that way, but they need something to say. So my conclusions. Um, Incidents are often a source of poor risk responses. They can be an opportunity, of course. The never waste a crisis dictum, dictum is a bit dangerous, but, but sometimes there are cases where you've got a policy which you'd like to move forward and you just need a chance. But generally, it's a source of poor risk responses. The key moments are how you handle the early hours and days and how follow-up is organized. And the conclusion, I think, that the government needs to create space for itself to get the right answers. So thank you very much. That's all from me. Now I should be asking you questions about coalitions all afternoon. Um, Simon, just one, one second. Just one question, because on one of your slides, 
um, you said what we have to do is to taste the risk appetite of the public. What do you exactly mean by that? Um, you, you can go and get some reference groups together. Um, is one way of doing it. The other thing, oddly enough, you can do is to, is, is in, in, in Britain at least, you can get your ministers to go and walk about and talk to people quietly and take the pulse of their own political party and talk to their members, go back to their districts. And oddly enough, they will very often come back with a, with a measured sense of that. So I, I think you can, you can do some things about that, either of a sort of structured kind that a, you know, a, 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 a survey group will do for you um, or, or, or do it at a, at a more political level. Uh -huh, because I was thinking that it was a bit of more of a sort of symbolic activity, but as you explain it now, it could be really an actual gathering of information. Yes, and one of the things we discovered in, in England, where I'm actually doing the review of the swine flu, the crisis, the, the flu response last year, is that you know, some, some things resonate hugely with the British public, which may be different in other countries, but certainly uh, human diseases right. re mm. resonate as risks hugely greater than, for example, animal diseases. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting dilemma. Okay, thank you.